Welcome again to the Red Letter Challenge. We are here into the fifth major principle in this, the fifth of five. And uh, here in the Red Letter Challenge, we're looking at those words of Jesus, red letters as in the letters that are written in red type as compared to black type uh, in some translations of the Bible, so that you can highlight and know which words Jesus spoke that are written in red. And so over the course of this 40-day challenge, we've been reading one word from Jesus each day and striving to put it into practice because that's what Jesus directs us to do. Red letter challenge. Uh, it's the week where we're talking about going. But can you uh, tell me whether or not you know, maybe we can call out together uh, what the weeks of the red letter challenge are? Well, what's the first one? We first talked about being. Very good. And then forgiving. Good. Serving. Giving. And now going. Yeah. So going, I think sometimes as we think about going, we think about the, the things that we're, places we're told to go, like maybe go to the school, go to the store, go to work, go home, go. And we think about going in terms of where we are going, but indeed going it has a lot less to do with where at least in the context that we're looking at. That verse that just flashed up there, it was read earlier for you from Matthew 28. It is the, the verse on the back of your bulletin uh, highlighted on there if you want to look at it and have something to meditate on this week. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a kind of a verse of the week to memorize. Go and, and make disciples. But notice the translation is a little different. It's not really about the where. The translation helps us see this. It's really, as you are going, make disciples. Now, it was, a, it was a prophet seminary that pointed that out to me first, that, that really, if you look at the original language for that, it's not go like, hey, uh, from this location to that location, make sure you accomplish the trip, but more of in the process of life as you are going along. So the picture is somebody going along the path of life, and as you are doing that, here is what you do. Well, what does it say? As you are going, make disciples. As you are going, make disciples. Now, in the course of the Red Letter Challenge here, we've been talking about uh, ways that Jesus directs us in terms of how to make disciples. Really, all of what Jesus is talking about is all pointed in that direction and uh, pushed towards this. Go and make disciples. And this has sometimes um, been boiled down to uh, a single phrase that I think has some merit to it, and I think it'll be a good way for us to begin talking about this, but there's something flawed in it. Hey, anybody ever heard this one before? Preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. Raise your hands. Who's, who's heard this one before? Preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. The thought here is, we got to make sure we're living this stuff out, which is what Jesus is telling us to do. This is what Red Letter Challenge is all about. Matthew 7, we, we started with where Jesus said, look, if you hear these words of mine and put them into practice, you're like a wise person. And if you hear these words of mine but do not put them into practice, this is a foolish thing to do. You're like a foolish person. So putting it into practice, preach the gospel as in like show by your actions that uh, who Jesus is, by your serving, by your forgiving, by your giving. So all good stuff. And in fact, even that verse that's on the back of the, the theme verse for the day, it talks about the way we make disciples is by baptizing. And we'll do a baptism later on in the service. Really cool um, opportunity today. And then, and so by baptizing and teaching them, to obey everything I have commanded you. So there is this action part to it. And, and in our, out in our world, doing it really is applauded well and encouraged. If you want to get into college, you better be doing some things out there so that you can put that on that college application. Often uh, those that are looking to build teams within a corporate setting go and serve together in some way. If you want to help develop character in uh, your children, we go and serve and, and give to other people. We know that doing opens doors so that people 
can hear. I mean, we've been talking about that all through the Red Letter Challenge. If I've spent time being with God, and then that leads me, knowing who I am, to forgive, to serve, to give, it catches people's attention. It helps me find the fullest experience of life for me, but it also catches people's attention. It opens a door, but the question is, what is the door open to? Not just us taking another step and moving on to the next person to serve. That isn't what God intended. It's open to using our words to talk about why we forgive, why we serve, why we give, and and who gave to us first, who served us first, who forgave us first, and who made us be who we are. Going week is about giving God our mouth to use for his glory and for his kingdom. That's what going and making disciples is all about. We're going to pick a Bible verse to put this succinctly that that really um, tells us why this is a misquoted thing. You'd go to Romans chapter 10, and Paul, uh, a pastor, has just been writing about uh, how faith comes about and how Jesus Christ is the one that has done it for you. And then he says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. So confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You will be saved. And right on the tail end of that, he says, but how will anyone know? How will anybody know what to believe? How will they have words to confess unless you speak it to them, unless you share it with them, those who now know these things and have been blessed in these ways? So he's saying, go and do this. Faith comes by hearing. Repeat that with me. Faith comes by hearing. One more time. Faith comes by hearing. So we've got to speak. Faith is how we're saved, but faith comes by hearing. Now, um, I know as soon as we begin talking about that, you go, whoa, 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 pastor. I am not qualified for that. Anybody had that thought before? Give me a raise of hands. I have thought I feel unqualified to speak about my faith. Very good. There are plenty of people that did in the first service, too. It's okay. Or, or maybe another objection. I, I feel like I don't know enough. To, to share my faith. Anybody in that camp? I feel like I don't know enough. Well, to the first one, I'd say you're right. Are you qualified to do that? No, not on your own. Guided by the Holy Spirit, empowered by Him, yes, you'll be able to. But to the second one that you do not know enough, I want to push on that today, but I'm not going to push on it by my own words. I'm going to push on it by words from Jesus Christ. They're from uh, Matthew, sorry, Mark chapter 5. Uh, beginning at verse 1, and I'm just going to summarize it for you because I think that'll be a better way to catch the picture, but I invite you to go back. Start at Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 5. I'm just loving Matthew today. (laughs) Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, and the the scene is this. Jesus has been out healing and caring for people, and he's usually done it in his kind of the home area with the other people that are, um, that have been, according to their heritage, followers of God. And then he goes across the lake to another area where people typically have not been followers of God. A Gentile area is what they call it. It's, it's foreigners and those who aren't believers. So he's going across on the boat, hops off on the shore, and there meets him on the shore is this man that, uh, as far as I can tell, this is how I picture it. I mean, maybe it's a little more colorful than what's really there. But I think this guy, it says he is possessed by a demon. It says he's locked up in shackles and he's like broken the shackles and crushed those kind of things and they've kind of put him there out on his own to uh, probably for his own protection and for the protection of other people. It's kind of this this cave in a rock side below a cemetery. I mean creepy kind of stuff. And I imagine this guy is sort of like somewhere between Samson and Shrek with the uh, temper tantrum of a tired two-year-old as his way of going about life. And as Jesus pulls up to shore, this man comes out to him. And you think he's just going to barrel Jesus probably right over, but he stops just short and drops to his knees. And the demons from inside this man, the ones that are controlling him, leading him to do things he doesn't want to do, speak out to him and says, get away from us. You're you're tormenting us. Well, there, he's like the king tormentor of the year. And Jesus says, "Tell me your name." And it says, "We are legion. We are many." 
There were tons of demons that had come to be inside of this man. I don't know why or for what purpose. But they were the ones that were controlling him and leading to this, and Jesus knew just what to do. He starts the exorcism right there to to get these demons and cast them out of him so that they wouldn't continue to put him in bondage and do all of these things. And they kind of start bartering with him then. It's kind of a funny bargaining. They're like, no, no, don't throw us out. Can we go into the, the herd of pigs over there? And so Jesus says, okay to that. I can't explain that all right now, and you can dig into it later. But anyways, the, the demons come out of the man. That's the important part. Come out of this man and go into this herd of 2,000 pigs, and then those 2,000 pigs go running off the cliff to their, uh, to their demise and go wee, wee, wee all the way home. And who's left but a man now in his right mind, freed from the shackles, clothed again, and the people from the town come out to look at him and are like, what happened to that guy? They were amazed, it said. And Jesus wants to go on from there, and the man's like, oh man, you changed my life. I want to come with you. And then Jesus says this. Before I show it to you, this man had known Jesus for all of what? Three minutes? Five? Spent that much time with him. And Jesus says this to them, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Apparently, according to Jesus, this man is qualified to go and share this. The Spirit goes with him, and this man has enough information. He knows enough. How is that possible? Well, Jesus is trading on something that that he knows to be true, and quite honestly, those that have been uh, advertising to us in commercials have proven to be true time and time again, and that's this. The product matters, but who uses it matters more. This is the, the professional athlete selling shampoo. Like, what do you know about shampoo, buddy? But nonetheless, they put him up there because that gets name recognition. Because we tend to pay attention to and even strive after um, the things that are good in the lives of people that are like us. We aspire toward that. We can see ourselves in them. And we also aspire toward um, being like people that are ones that we want to be like. So maybe I want to be like this uh, professional athlete, so I'm going to do the things that he does. Connected back to the Bible story to this truthful, historical representation of God at work in our world. This man has credibility to go out because God has had mercy on him. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. I find this to be true. Who says it matters? Which was actually sort of a sad reality for me as I became a pastor because I realized that at that point, as soon as I put on the the official uh, you're a pastor thing, it kind of discounts my story in some ways because people no longer look at me like, oh, that guy's just like me. Instead, he's the professional Christian. He has to say these things. He has to live that way. That's his job. He's got time for that in a way that I don't and I can't relate. So in some ways, my story doesn't have the same kind of credibility as someone who's not in that position. And I lamented that uh, initially. In fact, uh, let me just help to drive that point home from you. I need you to, to get your finger up like this. Get the gun ready. Get the pointer ready. Point it at me. And now repeat after me. Yep, this is good. Pastor, there are people who you can't reach but I can. All right, now take that same pointer and point at somebody in the pew next to you. Now here's the test whether or not you learned their name when we were doing handshakes before, because now I'm going to invite you to say their name on three, one, two, three. And repeat after me this as well. There are people that I can't reach, but you can. And clearly none of us, you can put your fingers down now. Uh, 
None of us are reaching them on our own. It is God working through us. But what I'm talking about is the relationships that we're in and the peers that you've got in all of that. This is what Jesus has called us to. It's what he called his first disciples to when he said, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I will be one that works through you in your life to help transform the lives of those that you are walking through life with. That's where the the gospels, the the portions of scripture that have the red letters of Jesus in them uh, begin. Come follow me. Jesus is welcoming people to come be with him. And then at the end of them, they're all talk about going. Go and be my witnesses. Just flipped to the last chapter in each one of the Gospels, and you're here again and again. Do what Jesus has done. Continue that on. You are my witnesses. Go make disciples. That Matthew 28 is from the end of Matthew. Continue what I've begun. I give you my authority. My spirit will empower you. So what does that look like that he's given us to do to go be, go be fishers of men? What is going like Jesus? Well, we really see Jesus go in two main ways. Number one, he goes and talks to large groups of people, and he goes and interacts with them on an individual kind of way. And you might be thinking, oh, okay, pastor, am I supposed to go talk to big groups of people? No. I'm not saying that y'all got to be pastors. In fact, I think it's better that we're not all pastors because you are in places that I can't be and have credibility that I don't have in the circles that you live in and the people that you interact with. So what is a large group sharing for you going like Jesus? It means come on to church with me. And I can tell you stories about how I have done something like that, but because I know the who matters, not just what's said, I want to tell you of a story of someone that inspired me. It was about a year ago. She was uh, eight years old. I got a chance to go along with her to uh, Hot Cakes and Rakes, and we were just down the street from church. Literally, you could see the church building from there as we're, we're raking up the yard. Uh, this little eight-year-old uh, had needed to go in and use the bathroom. It was a cold day, warm up a little bit. Uh, got done with that. Comes out to the, the, the lady of the house, the single mom, and comes up and just wraps her up in a hug. And you could just see the woman kind of like melt. Like, oh, yeah, I'll, t- I'll take one of those. And then she proceeds into uh, a conversation. Hey, where do you go to church? She goes, oh, I, you know, I've been to a lot of churches, but I don't really have a place that's, that's my church home. And she goes, well, you should come to mine. It's pretty awesome. The people there are really nice, and I really like it. What do you think? That was my little daughter. And I don't say that because it's her, but because that inspires me. The, the boldness that I see there, and, and just the progression that I see, and, and really that, that second part, that personal interaction, that sharing of her own story, that's what I heard there, and that's what Jesus calls us to do. She talked about, let me tell you how it's done in my life, how it's been a, a blessing to me, and come along to this place where you can be taught about this, and you can receive these things as well. God gave her a way to serve, and that opened a door so that she could share her story and make that invitation. Because God had been at work in our lives. She talked about uh, how God had had mercy on her, just like that man that had been uh, possessed by the demons. God had been at work in her life. Let her to come to church. Be blessed by people like you. Learned about who Jesus is just as much, maybe even more so from Sunday school than what we've done at home because, man, we struggle to make time for all of that as well. As much as you might want to call me the professional Christian, I'm still in process too. Nonetheless, she talked not just about an invitation to church. She's unconsciously competent, and this is, I guess, here's a a dad brag moment for a minute here, but I think it tells the point. Uh, It was conference time here this past week, and normally the the comments that a teacher brings for uh, the the conferences are all about school, math, writing, social interactions, all that kind of stuff. Well, this teacher, same girl, same daughter, 
wrote about um, an opportunity in class where there was a boy that had needed a Band-Aid. He was, he was bleeding. He'd bumped himself on something. And uh, my little girl gets running up and goes to grab the Band-Aid and takes it over there and gives it to him. And, and it's, it's all taken care of. And, and the teacher's just coming alongside. And she exclaims to the class, Oh, man, you are our Savior. To which she promptly replies, No, I'm not. That's Jesus. And the teacher tries to clarify, no, 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 I mean you're being helpful and all that, and she proceeds to argue with her. No, 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 Jesus is the Savior, it is not me, he's the one who died, and I'm like, sweetie, do you realize that you were sharing your faith there, and everybody else had a chance to overhear, and she goes, huh. <laughs> it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And if her friends ended up having questions, she could say the same thing to the woman that she did in the yard where she was raking. Come with me. I got someone that can help you answer that question. I got some people that have been a blessing to me. They're really nice. And they know some things about Jesus that I don't know yet. So come along and and walk with me. Let's go be fishers of men together. To put it simply, the more you spend time being with God, forgiving, serving, giving with God's people, the better you'll be equipped for sure to to be able to share those kind of things. And those were instrumental in her life. But you don't need to know any more than what you know right now because God has already had mercy on you. If you are one that trusts in him, you have had a change in your life that maybe you've forgotten about how transformative it is that your eternity is now going to be with God forever. I think sometimes we get caught up in the the story of, of God being in my life in terms of like, I was addicted to this or my life went off the rails in this way and God brought me around this way. Friends, all of our lives were off the rails. We were on our way on a road to hell. And Jesus Christ broke those chains just like he broke the chains of that demon-possessed man and made us free and set us on the road to be with him forever. A road that begins here at baptism, which we're going to celebrate again today. And I hope you'll think about your own baptism as we do that. And you'll realize that as God has worked in your life to make you free, to give you new life again, that that is bigger than even him casting out demons in the midst of this mortal life because he has changed your eternity. You have experienced the mercy of God. There is tons that he has done for you. Over the course of this week, you're going to be invited to consider, to write, to practice, and to record how God has been at work in your life. If it were my daughter, she might write some about those stories that were were there. Maybe you think that you don't have too much to share there. There's nothing amazing that's happened in my life. Well, let me tell you my story. Maybe yours sounds a little bit like this. I think it is compelling because it has transformed my life. It sounds like this. My parents taught me about Jesus when I was young. They brought me to church from since I was a little kid. We went to youth group. My parents found it a priority even to be leaders in that, and they showed me by their actions that giving time toward and making it a priority was important in life, and so I understood it to be that, and God worked through, through those people. And then I had a, another person come into my life, a mentor at the local Bible camp, who taught me and encouraged me to read God's Word, and it transformed me in, in a way that, that the other teaching hadn't quite as much before as I read God's Word regularly. And and I came to be a counselor at that camp where someone challenged me. You understand Jesus to be your Savior, but will you let him be the Lord, the one that leads your life? And that was a pivot of putting God's words into practice that has made a change for me ever since that point. That has led me into things that, that I am proud of, not because of what I've done, but because God has blessed me through them, giving me direction in finding my wife and in waiting to marriage to, to treat one another like husband and wife. We are still reaping the benefits of that, uh, of helping to mis- me to see as I walked through life the emptiness of the temptations of life it found in alcohol or illicit images or arrogance or self-centeredness. How it's directed me through his word toward wisdom of thankfulness in everything. And I'm honoring God for what all the benefits are in life. Of giving me purpose and perspective for life as a whole. And truth that meets all the things that science is finding. 
I've found increasing contentment in what I have, self-acceptance in some places and striving in others as God directs me toward it. I now find myself at a spot where I have no fear of death or of sickness, and I increasingly find contentment. And I have ways to deal with the stresses of life, putting them into God's hands to give me a peace that just doesn't make sense in the midst of it all. That's been my experience with God. And if you come along with me to church and walk with me on this walk, God can do that for you too. That's what I might say. And I invite you to figure out what your story is this week, how God has worked in your life to tell of his mercy so that at the end of this week you're prepared for the conversation that inevitably God has lined you up for with the people that are along your path so that as you're going, you'll not just serve in the way that Jesus served with your actions, but in the way that he served with his words, the transformative word of God that changes hearts by the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. Gracious Father, move in us, lead us. Help us to follow you in every place and see where you've been at work and not to take for granted how you have transformed not just this life, but our eternities. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.